But in the interest of time today, I think we'll forego some of our typical announcements. Uh, just a quick thank you to the DuPage Unitarian Universalist Church who provides us this space and uh, uh, moral and practical support, and also the humanists of West Suburban Chicagoland, of whom I am a member, um, and many of our chapter board members and members are here today as well. Uh, they also provide support. Uh, check us out on HWSC, which is Humanists of West Suburban Chicago Land, uh, .us on the web. Uh, also, these talks are on YouTube. Uh, I've got a couple of the prior ones, I think three of the prior ones up on YouTube, still waiting uh, some post-production on the Big Bang uh, talk because of all the technical problems some of you may have remembered. Uh, so today, <clears throat> today we're going to talk about the strange and interesting relationship between math and science. Um, many of you have some perhaps less than fond memories of science in, in or I'm sorry, of mathematics and perhaps of science in your youth. And so today we want to uh, try to dispel some of that fear if you have any lingering fears. There's going to be a, a couple of equations, but nothing you have to solve. I was asked uh, a week or so ago if there's going to be a quiz. Um, <laughs> No quiz. There is some bonus material at the end that I could cover if you're interested, uh, like a good math class. So let's just dive right in. Math is a huge topic. So I got my bag. I think I left it back here. Let me get it real quick. My blue bag. Yeah. <laughs> So I got my bag of tricks. I was, I was uh, very gently castigated last time for not having more tricks in my talk. So I bought, I brought some, some things to hopefully add some spice to what we're doing today, uh, including some math jokes. Let's start one. Let's start off with a good math joke. Uh, how many molecules in a bowl of guacamole? <laughs> And avocados numbers worth. All right. That's one of the better jokes. Yeah. So this is a book I refer to with some regularity. It's from my personal library. This is a companion to mathematics. This doesn't presume to be exhaustive. Um, today we're only going to go about halfway through this. So... <laughs> this is available if anybody wants to use it for reference material. Right. Doorstop? No, that's a waste of knowledge. All right, so it's a huge topic. We're not going to get uh, too far into it. I want to pick out some things that are specifically interesting um, and relevant to the, some of the topics in science and specifically physics we're going to talk about this year. And I'll, t I'll talk about those as they come up. Um, and uh, just don't be scared, right? If you've got a question, if, if I allude to a symbol on the screen, you don't know what that symbol means. If I use a word you don't understand, please stop me. I'll do my best to explain it in um, different language that you might be able to, to more easily, uh, f uh, more, more familiar with. Um, so remember, math is fun. So order versus chaos. I'm not going to read this. I want to, <clears throat> this is the sermon part of the lecture. <clears throat> So we could live in a universe where things are completely random. And, and by completely random, I mean things like bed sheets could turn into butterflies. And when you drop a ball, it could jet sideways, or perhaps it could fly off to Alpha Centauri, which would disintegrate into, um, I don't know, wormwood by the time it got there. It could be completely chaotic and unpredictable. In such a chaotic and unpredictable universe, it's very, very unlikely that any kind of systemic processes such as we see with life or the way stars turn elements uh, into one another, uh, we talked about that last time, it's very unlikely that those kinds of consistent processes would occur. So one of the amazing things about our universe is that it is consistent, that it has regular patterns. It has patterns through space, and it has patterns through time. There are some things that we take for such granted that are, are deeply ingrained into the fabric of the reality in which we inhibit. If I were to, uh, to give my talk at the back of the room, 
You might have to turn your head to watch me, but you wouldn't expect the laws of science or the rules of mathematics to apply differently at the back of the room than you do here. So that's one of the amazing things is that mathematics allows us to describe pattern and regularity and predictability across space and time. So math has a lot to do with discovering, uh, discovering these patterns and giving a particular and useful vocabulary to these patterns. One of the things that might happen if I were giving this talk at a different location in this room is it makes sense to figure out how, how you would have to turn your head. And different people would have to turn their heads a different amount depending upon where they were relative to me. And that kind of recognition that the universe is dependent upon our point of view to a certain extent allows us to measure what's special about our point of view. We can do things that are um, not, not only measure distance and location, but we can also measure orientation. Let's see, I'll get through this. Sam has got nothing on me this year. <coughs> So one of the things that we can do is, uh, if you don't mind holding this for me. So we can do things like recognize that when we have one thing anchoring the point of an object, a flexible object, and we have something else anchoring the other point, we can recognize what we call a line. Right? We take it for granted, but isn't that amazing that, that two things separated from each other and uh, uh, can be best described, the shortest distance between them, by a line. I mean, that's not necessarily a foregone conclusion. It's a property of our universe. And because of that, if you keep holding that, maybe I'll, I'll give you an end here. And because of that, we can do other interesting things with these lines. We can, uh, you can hold it taut, if you will. Um, we can make things like angles, where we've got two lines, and we see that um, in our real world, this is not a mathematical abstraction, we've got real world implications of this. So if I go straight out from here, we see that there's, a, uh, there's an angle here. And as I, as I move over here, maybe there's a slightly different angle. And so perhaps this is something we can measure, the change in this. Right? These are real world phenomena. There's a certain a view of mathematics that it has uh, something called platonic reality, which is there's a perfect mathematical world. But we don't have to inhibit that perfect world. In our own world, we can see how just simple notions of measurement and angle and straight lines become relevant. Thank you very much. Another thing we can do is that we can compare ratios. I thought, in fact, I, I, uh, I have a a ribbon that has markings on it, and it's got consecutive numbers like one, two, three. And I decided not to bring that today. And the reason for that is because we can discover something called a ratio. If we've got two, two uh, distances, we can compare those two distances to one another. We've got this distance that's shorter than this distance, and if I make it a little more manageable, we can say that that's one unit, and this is two units, and this is three units along that distance. So we automatically get to the point where we can count things. So mathematics is about counting. It's about relationships. It's about understanding the kinds of things that we have in our world that we can begin to quantify. We can count yams. We have one yam. We have two yams. So is this two? Is this one? Is it half of a casserole? Right? So we can count things in different ways, and counting is a very practical thing that our universe allows us to do. This isn't going to change into a bunny rabbit spontaneously. We know that. Our world is constant and predictable, and many of the mathematical properties of our world are constant and predictable. Let's see. I've got another cheat sheet in here. Oh, here it is. All right. <clears throat> Time for another joke. What do you call male friends who love math? Algebros. <laughs> <clears throat> so the Nobel Prize for 2014 in physiology and medicine. <clears throat> that Nobel Prize was granted to these three people. 
And they did something amazing. They were looking at the actual wiring of the neurons in the brain at a particular location. And what they found was that there is a, a, a hexagonal grid of neural connections located uh, in, uh, near the memory center of the brain. And that this grid is literally hexagonal and it overlays different scales of grids. So you see we could draw another hex uh, hexagon up here. And what they discovered through years of research doing different projects, those three people, was that these geometric patterns of the neurons in this part of our brain are exactly correlated with our ability to be able to navigate in space, to walk through a room, or in the case of this poor rat, some confusing maze. <clears throat> that ability to spatially orient ourselves is dependent, critically dependent upon the fact that the world doesn't change much and so we can create a model. It's also dependent upon the fact that two yams could be represented by two pens, right? The concept of two-ness could be represented or modeled by something other than the thing itself. Similarly, when we're modeling the concept of orientation or configuration of one thing relative to another, we don't have to exactly duplicate it. We can model that with some other abstraction. So we can model a very complex maze with a series of hexagonal cellular connections in the brain. And that ability that we have to create a model in our own minds, in our own biology, is really critical. Now one thing about creating models that many of you may not recognize is that you all have the ability to do calculus. Right? I assume that there are at least some of you who have never studied calculus. But I guarantee you that all of you have the ability to do calculus. Let's see, how can I, how can I prove this? I need something, um, something soft. What have I got here? Uh. All right, I've got something soft. All right, somebody's going to catch this. Good job, all right. So what he did, when he caught that, <laughs> What he did when he caught that was his m brain processed a parabola. This thing describes a parabola as it moves through space. And you don't have to solve Newton's equations of motion in any kind of literal way to be able to do that. Your brain and the brain of most creatures on Earth has some innate ability to do complex mathematics because we live in a mathematical world. So anytime you catch something, you're solving that equation without using symbols, but you probably are using some special cells in your brain that may be uh, somewhat analogous to this. Does that make sense? So let's talk about some great mathematicians. This is the stuffy part of the talk. <clears throat> um, Archimedes. Archimedes was the fellow who famously said, if you give me a lever long enough, I can move the world. One of the things that's particularly noteworthy about Archimedes is that he has, he, he developed a reputation for being a practical thinker about mathematics and what we would call science. He invented all kinds of interesting devices. He didn't just think like Plato or uh, Pythagoras in their, uh, uh, in, in their salons or wherever they were in Greece. Uh, thinking in the abstract. He did practical things. He measured real things about the world with his mathematics. And he also famously um, yelled Eureka after jumping out of his bath uh, naked. There's a strategically placed railing there. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, according to legend, somebody had challenged him to find the, uh, whether something was real gold or fake gold, and he used uh, volume, and the, the fact that when you're in a bathtub, you displace a certain amount of water. He used this fact to come up with the notion of measuring density for the first time that we know of. Right? Density became a real property of things that we could measure. And he was very excited about this, as, as you would probably be. <clears throat> uh, the next mathematician we're going to talk about is the fellow who dropped things on the heads of ped pedestrians from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Um, Galileo. So notice the time difference between these two people. Right? Um, 
nearly, well, more than 1,500 years. It's not necessarily true that there were no prominent mathematicians uh, in, the, in, in the world before that, but the Romans, especially after they took over for the Greeks, did a lot of practical work with existing knowledge. They became great architects and engineers, but they didn't do much to advance science. And then uh, the so-called Dark Ages and the Renaissance, and then this fellow comes along. And Galileo, Galileo was an incredible mathematician. He often gets short shrift, you know, the church hated him and he had a telescope. Well, that's just a little bit of what he did. He was the first person since Archimedes for whom we have a record that applied mathematical laws and tried to describe those laws in a very concrete and clear way and showed how those mathematical properties, which are derived, again, from geometry, from counting, from the orientation of different things, simple properties of the universe that took someone of genius to be able to explicitly write down and notate and, uh, and deal with. And uh, Galileo did that, among other things. Uh, this is a famous quote. I'll read it for those of you who may have uh, uh, limited distance ability. The great book of nature can be read only by those who know the language in which it was written. And this language is mathematics. All right, the next guy we're going to talk about is uh, Isaac Newton. Now, Isaac Newton's primary vocation was a numerologist and an alchemist. I don't know if you know that or not, but he spent more time trying to figure out the secret code hidden in the Christian Bible than he did doing science. And he was also looking for the philosopher's stone that would turn uh, different things into gold. The idea that gold is the perfect element, it re it's represented by the sun, hence its, its chemical name aurum, which is about light. And uh, if you could make this stone that could turn things into gold, well, this same stone should be able to make a human immortal. And who wouldn't want an Isaac Newton still around today, right? <clears throat> so he recognized how valuable he was, and he was searching for immortality. <clears throat> with his <clears throat> alchemical processes. But you know that, <clears throat> pardon me, that parabola I was talking about that you've got programmed into your brain? <clears throat> he was the first one to write down the math that described that. And he saw that the relationship between that parabola and the, uh, the orbit of planets around the sun and the fall of an apple are all related to the same underlying phenomena. And again, that's a kind of another layer of abstraction of this concept of modeling. Right, we can represent these by something else. We can represent them by patterns in our brain. We can represent them by notations on a piece of paper. Isaac Newton came up with a symbology to represent the orientation and relationship between things that move under the force of gravity and things that, uh, that don't move. And <clears throat> these laws of motion and other things that he came up with, with the laws of optics, he was famous for, for describing everything he did with regards to science in a very mathematical way. And he was so obsessed by math, again, that he was looking for the hidden code in the Bible. One thing that's curious is that Newton was born the same year Galileo died. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. In 1642. Okay, some more um, mathematicians. Jumping ahead a couple hundred years. Uh, Leonard Euler. And he is, in some sense, considered the greatest pure mathematician who ever lived. Um, there's some de debate about that um, with this other guy, Carl Friedrich Gauss. And um, I don't know, Euler got a stamp and Gauss got a 10 uh, Deutschmark note. Oh, thank you very much. So... Uh, I don't know if that says anything about their relative status or not. <laughs> and then there's this guy, you probably haven't heard of him, uh, Evris Galois, and he was uh, uh, very instrumental in developing something called group theory, which has become very prominent in, in discussions about particle physics and, and some higher <laughs> physics. Um, I think, I, I forgot to look it up again after I came here. It's been a couple years. I, if I remember correctly, he was killed in a duel. Um, so fairly barbaric practice that winnowed our population of mathematicians and politicians in this era, if you remember Alexander Hamilton. 
It was, yeah, it was over a, a girl. Yeah. So he, I don't know, he gets a postcard and a cancellation stamp. So, <clears throat> so the 20th century, <clears throat> pardon me, oh, I'm going to take this. Thank you, Stephanie. So Bernhard uh, Reinman, for, for many millennia, literally, since Euclid, people have been arguing about something called the parallel postulate. Um, raise your hand if you know what that is. Okay, some explanation is in order. <clears throat> One of Galileo's fundamental postulates is that if you draw a line... Uh, Euclid, what did I say? Uh, Sorry, Euclid. Uh, one of Euclid's uh, fundamental postulates is that if you draw a line, we'll use this as that line, the top of this uh, um, podium here. If you draw a line and then you select a point on that line, there is exactly and only one line you can draw through that point that, um, that will uh, never intersect some other line drawn through some other point, right? That, that lines can be parallel, and there's a very unique aspect to being parallel. There's only one line you can draw through a point that is parallel to some other arbitrary line. And this postulate, <clears throat> it seems fairly intuitive if you think about it. I mean, we use this when we uh, talk about things like Pythagorean theorems and, and other, uh, we use this proof when we're in high school geometry to prove relationships between triangles and shapes and whatnot. But nobody, the parallel postulate is very different than all the other postulates. One of the other postulates is that uh, um, an infinite series of points uh, uh, co constitute a line in, in one direction. That's very simple and elegant. Another is that one point on a line, you can construct one line through that point that doesn't intersect ever another line drawn through a separate point on the same. That becomes fairly complicated. If it's that complicated, shouldn't there be some underlying way that we can prove that? Well, people tried for centuries to, and millennia to prove this parallel postulate, and it, you can't prove it. And one of the things that, <clears throat> that uh, Bernhard Reinman did was he showed that the parallel postulate is true only in a very special case of geometry, a geometry called Euclidean geometry, after Euclid. Um, and he, he developed a mathematics for describing other kinds of geometry, and we'll talk about that a little later. And then this is one of my favorite <clears throat> near contemporary mathematicians. There are hundreds of mathematicians I've left out, but this lady, Emmy Noether did an amazing thing. She did an amazing service to science. What, <clears throat> what Emmy showed through her mathematical work is that any time you have a conserved quantity or a conserved relationship, that um, there's a certain symmetry associated with that in mathematics and vice versa. So anytime you have a symmetry in mathematics, you've got a conserved relationship. And the amazing thing is that these conserved relationships extend to the real world. So let me give you a, uh, try to give you a concrete example. If, <clears throat> if I do something in one space, right, I throw this up, I expect it to come down very predictably according to some abbreviated uh, or very tight parabola. If I go over here, Remember how the universe essentially doesn't change, but my dexterity does <laughs> from place to place. And that ability to be able to do an experiment <clears throat> or describe a mathematical relationship in two different places and have the results be consistent and agree with one another, that implies that there is a conserved quantity in nature. And that quantity happens to be uh, momentum in the case of position. I won't get into the details. In fact, I'm not sure I could uh, deal uh, with the math required to make the proof. But the underlying notion is quite elegant. <clears throat> the fact that physical processes occur the same way at different places imply that the conservation of momentum is true. <clears throat> 
Well, one of the things that tells us is that when somebody says, well, maybe the laws of nature are different on Pluto than they are here, well, we've, we've got some pretty good evidence that that isn't the case because we can see uh, the motions of Pluto and its moons, and we can uh, calculate that the conservation of momentum and angular momentum is still applying to those. So we can see that the implications of the idea that physical measurements and physical processes don't uh, depend upon your location outside of a gravitational or electric or other kind of field. That very notion that there's a certain symmetry, that you can go any place in space and see the same things happening, that necessarily, mathematically, provably gives rise to the conservation of momentum. Similarly, the fact that I can do things uh, at different times, right? I, th I threw the, uh, the stuff animal early and then I just threw it again now and the results were similar. The fact that different processes have the same results through time implies a conservation of energy. And as we know because of Einstein, jumping ahead a bit, energy and mass are essentially equivalent. So the, equi the, the constancy or the conservation of mass and the conservation of energy uh, implies that uh, physical phenomena are symmetric through time. And there are other symmetries that had derived from Emily, from Emmy Noether's seminal work on the, on the topic that involve other forces of nature. And we'll talk about that in a subsequent lecture. Anyway, um, wonderful, wonderful work. There's some theory that this guy may be a mathematician. <laughs> I, I, I happen to ascribe to the view that um, mathematics and physics are so self-consistent the laws of nature are so elegantly interwoven and consistent with one another that the need for presuming there's some kind of outside or external entity that dictates uh, how the individual laws of nature work or how individual rules and mathematics work um, is unnecessary. The internal consistency in mathematics and science is phenomenal and beautiful. So let's talk a little bit about numbers. We talked about counting, right? One potato, two potato. That's one way to use numbers, and those numbers are fairly discrete, right? Um, you can represent them on a number line. There's also in-between numbers, right? One, one-half, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things that you can do is you can, I, I haven't tried this at home yet, is you can have well, maybe not a half, but a third of a potato, <laughs> right? Well, and there's been a lot of philosophical discussion about this. Is this a potato and this a potato now? Do I have two potatoes? Or do I have two-thirds of a potato and one-third of a potato? Or do I have two of something that are no longer potatoes, right? There's been a lot of talk about f from philosophers and mathematics and philosophers of science through the ages about what do, what do these things mean? That means we're more on our way to creating our casserole, I think, in this case. So the, this, this notion of in-between numbers is very interesting. <coughs> All, right, whoop. All right, fraction, the in-between numbers. Um, next, you've got things that are uncountable. So you've got, um, well, let me just show you a couple examples. You've got things called irrational number. The, the rational in this doesn't have to do with whether or not you um, have all of your mental faculties. Rational in this case means that you can represent a number as a ratio between one number and another. And there are some numbers that cannot be represented as a ratio. That's doing that thing again, where it's just jumping ahead. All right. Um, so if you have a, um, a triangle with unit length along the edges, then the length of the long side will be a number that's called the square root of 2. <coughs> and that number is irrational. It can never be represented as the ratio of one number to another. Here's some other irrational numbers that you may have encountered. Pi, um, E, which has to do with if something grows at a rate proportional to the amount that has already happened, it's kind of building on itself over time, then that ratio is described by this uh, special number called E. 
um, or Euler's number. And then there's a square root of two that we talked about. So all of these rational and counting numbers constitute real numbers. <coughs> I think one of the problems with math is that the vocabulary gets in the way sometimes. So I'm going to talk about that in a second, but first another joke. <clears throat> What's the difference between a PhD in mathematics and a large pizza? A large pizza can feed a family of four. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about uh, this idea of infinities. Imagine counting things. Imagine counting... Um, one potato, two potato, three potato more, etc. You can do that forever, literally. Right? Well, let's do something else now. Let's count the even numbers. Two, four, six, eight, etc. Well, you can do that forever. Same thing with the odd numbers. Same thing with the fractions, actually. Each fraction is represented as an integer over some other integer. So all of those things are countable. And in math, there's this idea of mapping. You've heard, anybody remember the ideas of domain and range when you were talking about function and whatnot and set theory? Well, there's this idea in, in math of mapping. So let's say that we had all the numbers, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and then we've got uh, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11. Well, you can map those to each other one to one. And as far as you want to go on your number line, you will be able to do a one to one mapping of things that are countable. That ability to delineate the members of that set that is infinitely large implies that there's a kind of infinity there. There's a countable infinity. Well, there's also the sets of irrational numbers like pi and e and an infinitely, uh, sorry for using that term again, um, a vast array, an uncountable, literally uncountable array of additional numbers that are irrational numbers. So we have two kinds of infinity, at least. We've got a countable infinity, and we've got an uncountable infinity. And these, these in, kinds of infinities become relevant to science when we're doing things like quantum electrodynamics, where you, you do a calculation and we say, well, the space should have an infinite amount of energy in it. And you do another calculation about another phenomena that happens in the same spot. And you say, well, it takes an infinite amount of energy for that to happen. And they cancel out because they're the same kind of infinity. So sometimes when dealing with uh, math and science, you have to make sure that you're working with the right kind of unit. Are you dealing with something that's countable as an infinity or um, infinite in extent and uncountable? And there are other kinds of infinities, too, that we won't talk about. Um, and then there's this idea of something called imaginary numbers. Now, I think this is the worst name in mathematics. <clears throat> the, I, this, this came about because of this concept of real numbers. And there were these equations that kept showing up in, in, in math and in science that necessitated the use of something that was distinctly different than a real number. It had distinct properties. And we're going to talk about those properties in some depth in a, in a moment. But they decided that the term real number had already been taken. So why not use uh, imaginary, uh, imaginary numbers? And like I said, we're going to spend some time talking about that in a bit. Uh, but before we do, I want to have a little break from talking. And we're going to have a little demo of the uh, Pythagorean theorem. So it's some fun with geometry. Um, this is my partner, Dave, who's here with us. And he spent some time in the shop uh, constructing this device for us today. Um, so Dave, you want to come up and demo your apparatus? He was, off, he was also doing something with a llama. I don't know. That's our dog. He helped too. Oh, yeah. yeah. So. <clears throat> Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. You've probably heard it before. Um, this is a visual demonstration of exactly what that means. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. You can see it becomes quite obvious that they are, in fact, equal. Or at least pretty darn close. The, 
there's a little bit of, uh, of plumbing uh, <laughs> behind here, so we didn't quite make it. There's actually tubes that run through here, but um, they are in fact equal a squared plus b squared um, equals the larger c side. <laughs> Many hours of work went into that. So thank you very much, Dave. Right? Yes, right. Because there shouldn't be a right angle triangle. They could have that history. Right. Yeah, they proved, uh, they recently proved you cannot do that with cubes. So um, anyway, that, that, what that is, is a, I like that because it's a practical demonstration of these abstract mathematical rules. And you can imagine practical scenarios like calculating the area of a solar panel or, or any other kinds of things that require calculating areas that are very practical physical implementations of this mathematical rule. And it's nice to see them um, demonstrated in, in such a tangible way. Um, but one of the things about geometry is it depends on whether the parallel postulate is true. Remember I was talking about that? So there are other, um, there are other kinds of geometries that we can talk about. The parallel postulate is not generally true. It's only true in a very special case. You can imagine geometries where uh, if you were to go to the equator and create a, a, a perpendicular line to the equator and extend it and go uh, far away and draw another perpendicular line on the equator, those two lines would eventually meet, contrary to what Euclid hypothesized. So in a sphere with spherical geometry, you can have a triangle with three right angles. And one of the things that you might assume is that if you were a mathematician, you might be able to create some kind of formula that, that characterizes this curvature with a set of uh, um, deviations from Euclidean geometry. There's probably a formula that you can write that say how much it deviates by Euclidean geometry. And that's what the Reinman did, the fellow that I was talking about from the late 1800s. And Einstein used this idea when he was developing his notions of curved space-time. Similarly, if you have a uh, something called a hyperbolic geometry, then uh, when you construct a triangle with, with very short angles, it can still end up uh, making a large area, deceptively large. So the geometry of the space that you're dealing with can have uh, profound implications for the geometry that you calculate. And in the case of relativity, general relativity, the geometry of space that is defined by gravity affects things like the orbits of planets or the, the, the paths of light rays. And we're going to talk about that in a couple of lectures in uh, um, January. Um, let's talk about probability. So probability always ranges between 0 and 1. And um, there's some interesting aspects to uh, probability beyond that that you can spend a lifetime learning about with statistic. this is the uh, statistics this is the bell-shaped curve and the standard deviation which has what 68 percent of all uh, samples etc and so you can spend a great deal of time um, concerning yourself with statistics and the first people that did this were people who wanted to know how long you lived uh, statisticians and uh, or the first statistics came from the insurance company and the finance companies who needed to be able to project things so that they could issue insurance on cargoes going around the world, etc. So the first statisticians were uh, life insurance people to a large extent. Um, probability can make sense as a prediction and not so much as a postdiction. So let me give you an example of probability. What's the probability that a llama is going to be in space right there, a stuffed llama. Well, you know me, you know I've got a llama, so maybe you can presume it's gonna be nearly 100%. <laughs> but without, without that prior knowledge, it's just ridiculous. There's not gonna be a llama in the middle of the room, right? But when I throw this on a parabola, on a parabolic course, which I'm not doing anything special, it's just gravity doing its bit, right? When that happens, an interesting thing occurs. Well, I'll throw it back. As it travels along its path, every subsequent point in that path 
can be determined with 100% probability, right? So once you know how hard I'm throwing it and in what direction, you can predict with absolute certainty where this stuffed toy is going to be in the future. Yeah? It seems like because that toy might have some wind resistance, it might be harder to predict, or is that missing the point? Because as yeah, that, from... that's a different, different point, right? The physical reality is sometimes a little messier than mathematical reality, and you have to take things like that into account. But the wind resistance in this room is pretty negligible. Except when I'm talking. I'm talking about like on a piece of paper or on something because the animal's got, you know, I guess like I'm not saying like a perfect ball. I'd agree with you that you could predict with 100 percent, but because that thing has got wind affecting it because it's light as like a feather or a piece of paper, maybe that's missing the point. Though. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, so 99.99999 percent. Um, and, and that's a good point in that science is always provisional. Everything we know about science, we always say it's consistent with the data. It's consistent with our best knowledge. But maybe someday we'll figure out something that tweaks it a little bit. And I talked about that er in an earlier lecture, lecture. So there's a different kind of physics where if I were to throw an electron at you, the exact trajectory of that electron would not be determined with a 100% probability. Want me to come closer? <laughs> <laughs> and that kind of mathematics, where the trajectory of what we might presume to be physical objects is determined by probabilities, and some probabilities that are less than 100%, that kind of math and that kind of science is necessary for quantum mechanics. And we'll talk about that in... Uh, three months or so. So your probability can describe a, a distribution or a function that changes over space and time. It can be a three-dimensional probability. It can be a very complex uh, probability that's got uh, peaks and valleys and whatnot. And this is uh, germane to the concept of quantum mechanics. And we'll talk about that. Uh, logarithmic spirals from e to the x. Uh, I've got a little video about this. In the interest of time, I might show it at the end, but I'm going to skip it for now. Uh, logarithmic spirals in the form of e to the x, or more generally, r is equal to some constant times e to the another constant times x. Uh, the, the particulars of the algebra and the math aren't relevant. But the interesting thing is that these logarithmic spirals, um, they get bigger depending upon how far they've come. Remember, I talked about that when you're dealing with the, with the constant E. So the further you get, the further away it gets. <coughs> and this number E describes that property. And we see this happening in nature. All right? This is a nautilus shell. And this is real mathematics. Right? This isn't contrived. This is the way nature works. Here's another thing. Reminds me of the giant storm that's causing all this cold weather. It's up in the Pacific. Here's another thing where uh, thing in nature where that spiral pattern exhibits itself. And that's another concept of math and science that I think is really elegant. It's called the notion of universality. That once you describe how some process works on one scale or involving one set of uh, constituents, that same idea can apply to vastly different scales and vastly different constituents. Everything from the molecules of a seashell to the arms of star comprising billions and billions of stars of a spiral galaxy. Question? Yeah. Are you saying that the same ratio applies to the spiral galaxy as applies to the Nautilus? Uh, in, um, in general terms, yes. In there are different kinds of galaxies. Galaxies can collide with each other and get mixed up and whatnot. And so similar to his point about, you know, it's not quite perfect to say that this is 100% predictable um, in some sense. That same logarithmic pattern shows up in many things in nature, but it could be disturbed. You could imagine, for instance, if that nautilus shell was growing and it got injured, then maybe its shell would deviate from that model that we could use that would be an ideal model? Um, in principle, yes, but then it would be so idealized that it wouldn't necessarily tell us much about um, the complexity of real galaxies. Right? So as a, as a reduced model of how a galaxy might behave, 
dynamically, you can use that, but when it comes time to study real galaxies, you're going to have to take some of those real perturbations or deviations into account. Yeah. So let's get back to this idea of uh, the um, imaginary numbers. I, I like to think of them as peculiar numbers. And here's some peculiar aspects to those numbers. Now this is the math part. Um, I see that some people have already left the room. Um, <laughs> So if you take 1 and you multiply it, the dot means multiplication. So if you take 1 and you multiply it by itself, you get 1 squared. And that's also equal to? Ah, good job. If you take 1 and you multiply it by itself 3 times, so 1 times 1 times 1, you get? Starting to see a pattern here. So regular counting numbers, uh, especially the number 1, can be relatively boring. <laughs> Now let's take negative 1. You've heard of negative 1. Let's multiply negative 1 by negative 1, so it's negative 1 squared. What happens when you multiply a negative by a negative? Right. So, interesting, you multiply two different things than these and you get the same answer. So there's something interesting. Let's multiply three negative ones together. So a negative 1 times a negative 1 is a positive 1. And when you multiply a positive by a negative, you get a negative. Let's do this one more time. Let's raise it to the fourth power. So this time we're multiplying negative 1 times negative 1 and then multiplying that by negative 1 times negative 1. But remember, that equals positive 1. So it's positive 1 times positive 1, which is 1. And the same thing when we raise it to the fifth power. We're back to negative 1. So these are flip-flop numbers. As you multiply negative numbers by the other negative numbers, they flop from being positive to negative. So you can see that if there are phenomena in nature that require some kind of flip-flopping behavior, some yes or no states of existence, then positive and negative 1 might be a good way to represent them. Now, let's say that there's some number that when we multiply it by itself, it gives negative 1. Pretty simple concept, right? There's nothing scary about that. Well, this notion was so scary to some philosophers that they they rejected this notion for centuries. And mathematicians came up with a, with a symbol for this special number that when you multiply it by itself, it's equal to negative 1. And that is the symbol i. So when you multiply it by itself, it's equal to negative 1. Now, this has some very peculiar properties. If you multiply it by itself, it's negative 1. And you multiply it by itself a third time, well, it's negative 1 times i. So it's negative i. Have I lost anyone yet? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Maybe we can talk afterwards. <laughs> if we multiply the number i by itself four times, we come up with positive 1. If we multiply it by itself five times, we come up with i. So it flips from negative 1 to negative i to 1 to i. So it's got four distinct states. And one of the ways you can view this is that this is a number that imbues the notion of rotation. So anytime you have something that rotates or changes regularly, you can represent it by using this special new kind of number. So we might call these 2D rotational numbers instead of imaginary numbers. But I like to call them llama numbers because it's a lot less offensive to our sensibilities. So we've got real numbers, which we will call yam numbers. So we've got yams and llamas. And there's nothing scary about that. They just have different properties. <laughs> so one of the most beautiful, in fact, considered the most beautiful equation in math is if you raise this special number that describes spirals to a power, you multiply it by itself, whatever that means, and I can't describe it. Um, I can prove it mathematically. If you multiply it, by, uh, raise it to the i, that special number, the llama, if you raise it to a power of llama times pi, and you add 1 to it, you come up with 0. So these are some of the most profound constants in mathematics, e, i, pi, 1, 0, all represented uh, by one relationship. Now a bit of math. I think I mostly did that. Um, First, we need another joke. <laughs> Where do math teachers go on vacation? <laughs>
to Times Square. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so one of the ways um, to represent this e to some complex power is you can represent it by the cosine of the, uh, um, the real part plus the imaginary number times the sine of the real part. And without getting into details, it again describes this circle. And you may remember from uh, high school geometry that there's a nice relationship between circles and triangles that is entailed in this notion of sine and cosine. So just by representing something in this manner, e to some imaginary power, gets us to the point where we can do cyclic phenomena. And there's a lot of cyclic phenomena in the universe. Um, here, the value of this cosine plus sine, so the, the uh, uh, cosine of pi uh, halfway around a circle is zero, and the sine is uh, negative one, or the cosine is negative one. So this gives you an idea of how uh, that circle works. And I've got a proof of this that I have at the end of my um, equation. You can use this aspect of uh, e to some imaginary number to represent functions, so any kind of periodic functions. And when you com combine the numbers together, you get something called a complex number that has a real and an imaginary component. And it looks like we're running out of time, so I'm going to put the rest of this talk on the YouTube video. Uh, there's something about Benford's Law that I was going to do a demo. Uh, Phyllotaxis is the way sunflower seeds arrange themselves to get the most amount of coverage. And uh, like I said, I'll put the rest of this talk up on YouTube. You can look at it. Thank you so much for learning a bit about science and math. You'll remember from last uh, time, several of you were here. <clears throat> what I was talking about, I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to recapitulate just a little bit here. Math is fun, okay, don't be scared. Uh, I tried, I'm going to try my best to keep it fun <clears throat> today. Don't end up being like this person. <coughs> uh, built in mathematicians. You are all mathematicians, you just may not know it. One of the things that formal mathematics does is it translates the knowledge that we acquire about the world and some of the innate knowledge we have about the way the world works into symbols. And sometimes those symbols are intimidating. And one of the claims I made last week was that you all have the ability to do calculus, even if you haven't studied it. And that's going to be the only topic that I do again this, uh, this week. So I want, to, I want to prove that to you. I have my trusty llama, and we're going to be using the llama later. And uh, I'm going to prove to you now that you have the ability to do calculus. I'm going to throw this, and somebody's going to catch it. All right. He caught that. Thank you very much. Great catch. He caught that. He's a mathematician. <laughs> He's a mathematician. All right. Somebody else who isn't a mathematician. <laughs> Wait a second, that's a little sexist. <laughs> I just threw it, I'm sorry. Okay. So what does that prove? The trajectory that this llama describes in space can be mathematically represented by a parabola. Some of you may recall parabolas from your math classes. But you don't have to solve the equation for a parabola in explicit formal notation in order to be able to understand what a parabola is and to recognize that a parabolic trajectory is relevant when you are immersed in a gravitational field that imparts a constant acceleration to a moving body. Now all of that vocabulary sounds perhaps a bit intimidating, but you already know how to do it, <laughs> right? So a lot of times when we talk about math and science, the vocabulary gets in the way of appreciating how elegant and sometimes intuitive it is. There are also aspects of mathematics that are counterintuitive, and I want to talk a little bit about some of those today. So this is kind of where we left off last week. 
we were doing some uh, simple multiplication. So we see that uh, 1 times 1, which is represented by 1 squared, is equal to? Very good. You pass the quiz. 1 times 1 times 1, which is 1 cubed, is equal to 1. And we see we continue on through 1 to the fifth. Now let's try doing this with negative numbers. What's negative 1 times negative 1? Right. Interesting. What's negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1? That's a trick question. Minus 1. We can read. We can read. What? What? 3? We can read. Oh, I guess you gotta read. Okay, so what's 1 to the 4th? Okay. And then what's 1 to the 5th? Minus 1. Good. All right. So you see that unlike positive integers, when you have negative numbers and you multiply them together, they flip from being positive to negative. So there's a kind of motion, anything that in nature that describes a, a motion that goes from uh, maybe from up to down or side to side, it might be reasonable to in, uh, invoke using positive or negative numbers. Now, let's define a new kind of number where we multiply it by itself, just like we did here and here. And when we do that, we come up with negative 1. All right? It's a pretty accessible intellectual exercise. Let's call this number the symbol i. When we multiply it by itself, we get negative 1. And then when we multiply it by itself three times, it's negative 1 times this i. So it's negative i. You following along? Okay. Let's do it four and five times. If it's four times, it's negative one times negative one, because it's i times i times i times i. And a negative one times a negative one is a positive one. Finally, if I multiply it by itself five times, it's positive one times i, so it's positive i. So it goes from negative one to negative i to one to positive i. So this kind of number has four distinct characteristics, four distinct orientations, if you will. So one of the ways that we can use these kinds of numbers, these numbers that I'm denoting by i, is that we can use them to describe things that rotate, because it can go from here to here to here to here, right? It can describe circular or periodic motion. And we use that property of imaginary numbers uh, quite frequently. <coughs> Now one of the ways that's, uh, you can call these 2D rotational numbers, and <clears throat> mathematicians have done humanity a disservice in this sense. They have called those numbers imaginary numbers. Yes? How is the i, excuse me, how is the i5 result different than the 1 to the 5 result? I don't understand. Because the 1 to the 5 gives you a minus 1, and the i to the 5 gives you an i positive. Yeah, so if you follow through, um, so we know that i times itself is negative 1 by definition. Um, I, I kind of covered it up with my diagram here. But i times itself is negative 1. Oh, you started from a different premise. Right. Okay. It's a different kind of number. It's not 1. It's not negative 1. It's this okay. new thing. Okay, got it. And mathematicians have helped, quite helpfully called this an imaginary number, which isn't at all intimidating or weird, right? An imaginary number? How can that possibly be relevant to nature? It's imaginary. So that's the reason that I decided to come up with this concept of llama numbers. <laughs> Llamas are cute and fuzzy, and they sometimes spit, but we're not going to talk about that. And you see that you can quite easily, you can quite easily access the concept of imaginary numbers if instead we call them something like llama numbers. And if we take our regular kinds of numbers, let's represent them by, lamp, by yams, right? How many things do we have? Um, how many things in our bank account? Well, we've got one thing in our bank account, two. How many stars are there? Well, there's one star and another star. This idea that you can represent things symbolically with <laughs> other things, right? You can represent things with yams, or you can represent things with scratches on a clay tablet, or you can represent things by Arabic or Roman numerals. It's just a, it's, it's a mechanism that we use to represent one set of things by a different set of things, such that there's a correspondence, typically a one-to-one -one correspondence. 
So we can talk about YAM numbers being the numbers that we're uh, comfortable with historically. And when you combine them with um, uh, these llama numbers, these strange numbers, oh, sorry, got the, uh, <laughs> we get some interesting behavior. I'm not going to go through this in detail for the sake of time, but this just makes it very clear that you can use these in the context of rotation. Um, there's a definition about how if you raise uh, uh, this natural uh, e, e, the natural logarithm base to an imaginary power, you immediately get rotation. And I've got a proof of this that I'll put up as part of the YouTube video of this. But the interesting thing is if you combine a real component and an imaginary component, you get a whole third kind of number, which um, are called complex numbers. Now, complex sounds even more intimidating than imaginary, right? I don't want to deal with anything that's complex. But if you think of them as yam and llama numbers, then you've got, if you combine them, you have yam and llama numbers. Right? And that doesn't sound scary at all, right? It's, the vocabulary sometimes get, gets in the way, again, of understanding the concept. And if you get a little bit of one thing and a little bit of another, it's just a recipe for building uh, mathematical symbology. And this particular... Um, <coughs> characteristic of llama numbers or imaginary numbers allows us to develop all kinds of complex math that, uh, that facilitates the development of the mathematics of waves or periodic functions, etc. All right, um, Benford's Law, I'm not going to go through that today. Um, there's a really cool thing if you pick numbers randomly out of a phone book or addresses or dates of birth and you pick them randomly, they will have a very clear distribution and you can use that to look for fraud. You can look that up on, the, on Wikipedia. I might talk about it a little more on the YouTube video. And then there's phytotaxis. So if you look at a sunflower, the way seeds are arranged uh, in the center of a flower sometimes, you'll see a, a spiral pattern. And one of the things that's cool about nature, we're going to talk about natural selection next year. One of the things that's cool about natural selection is the better something works, the better it propagates through time, biologically. So you would think that the, what constitutes better in this context is the more seeds something can pack together in the, in, in, in the center of a flower, the, the denser the packing of little spherical seeds, the better, because more seeds means more potential offspring. Well, it turns out that you can describe that by a mathematical rule, and you come up with something that's described by that uh, logarithmic spiral that we talked about. So nature exhibits these spirals in many ways in the universe. Finally, there's a, or not, finally we got a couple more, line with numbers. So here's a couple of trend lines. You see this is dates from 1999 to 2009, and here's some intimidating looking numbers, 1800 to 30,000 or something up here, and you see that these trend lines are fairly correlated, right? There's a hump here, and there's a hump here. Well, you, you can lie with numbers. You can make some very strange, what are called correlations. The green line is U.S. spending on science, space, and technology. The red line is the number of suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation over time. <laughs> So you can see that you can construct this relationship in such a way that it looks very persuasive, that there's a correlation there. The more we spend on math and science, the more people off themselves. <laughs> what, what does this possibly mean? But if you look very carefully at the way this is constructed, you'll see at these points here, if you look at the red line, it actually goes down. The value decreases here. Something interesting happened in 2005. People got more cheerful or something. And then, uh, but if you look at this other graph, you see these humps are kind of look like they correlate here, but th this is actually where the data aligns. While this one goes down, this one goes up. So if you were to actually do the correlation, you'd find that the correlation isn't uh, as good as it looks. <coughs> you, can, you can cherry pick your data to give rise to uh, false correlations. And just because you see numbers in the newspaper or numbers on a news report, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have scientifically explained the cause for why they may or may not be correlated. <clears throat> All right, so you can lie with numbers. So let's talk about uh, uh, topology. Um, there's something called Euler's number, where if you take a polyhedron, like a tetrahedron, it's got four vertices, um, 
uh, six edges and four faces. So you can think about that. And then you do this very simple math problem and you subtract the number of edges plus faces from the number of vertices. And you do that for a tetrahedron and you come up with the number two. Well, if you do that for a cube, you also come up with the number two. And if you take all of these complex solids that you can make, you still come up with the number two. No matter how you construct a convex polyhedron in three-dimensional space, if you construct it out of more primitive shapes, no matter what, it has this number that describes the geometry of it. And if we take this level of abstraction even higher to where you get closer and closer to, the, to, to, to building a sphere, you have so many little tiny pieces that you add together so close together that you make a sphere, that comes up with a, with a two. Every sphere has a number of two. And that's a topological characteristic of that shape. There are other shapes that have other characteristic numbers. Here's that same number represented for different kinds of shapes. These theories, these uh, ideas about topology are relevant in things like uh, general relativity and quantum mechanics, where you start talking about complex spaces and how they are shaped. So we can describe the overall shape or characteristic of something numerically, and that's pretty surprising. Um, you can have unsolvable equations in math. Even Newton's equation for gravity is unsolvable if we have more than a couple bodies interacting at the same time. You can write down the equation that describes that interaction, but you can't solve it. You can't come up with a number like this particle is moving at 10 feet per second per second on January 3rd. Right? Some equations aren't solvable because the answers to many equations are other equations. That is the answer, and that doesn't necessarily lead to numerical solutions. And then Einstein made a more complex theory of gravity that involved, uh, you can look this up on Wikipedia, that involves many more terms, and that's even more difficult to solve because it interacts with itself. <laughs> you can have analytic solutions where you can solve an equation by plugging in numbers, Right, this is simple algebra, x plus six equals nine, well, x must equal three. Um, sometimes you can solve an equation if you have very clear boundary conditions, x equals three, only in the cases where y is equal to six. You can do numeric solutions, you can try values of x until something works, you can transform. So here's our, uh, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the exponential function last time. If you raise that, raise both sides of this equation to an exponential power, then you can have another valid equation that may or may not be easier to solve. And then you can do models and simulation to try and approach mathematical problems. You can do cellular automation, you can be uh, agent-based simulations, you can find analogous systems. There have been stories in, uh, in science news recently about using vortices in liquids to simulate the, uh, uh, the way space-time works around black holes. So why are we talking about all this math stuff? Because in December, we're going to, uh, which, it, well, this is actually November's talk. Those of you who are in a time warp, I apologize. Um, in December, we're going to talk about measuring reality. That will be in two weeks. And that really cues us up in January to talk about relativity. We're going to talk about quantum mechanics. Uh, we're going to talk about forces of nature and how that relates to symmetry theory, uh, April particle physics. And then in May, we're wrapping up with a talk about cosmology. And my final llama picture. <laughs> well, maybe not the final one, because today I came prepared. <laughs> All right, any questions? Yes? The nonlinear equation follows this arrangement of solution. Yeah, so it's, it, it becomes a little. Um, involved to talk about linear equations and how an equation can be dependent or independent of other equations. But in general, if I can give you a feel, a, a nonlinear equation is an equation where the terms are highly dependent upon one another in a way that isn't able to be represented uh, by, by an algebraically simple relationship. So, um, in, especially in cases where the solution to a problem is a, an equation itself, then you can see that you can kind of get a self-referential uh, situation where the solution to the equation changes the way the system works, which changes the way the system works, which change, right? It keeps feeding on itself. A lot of times, um, nonlinear equations 
come out of physical laws that describe systems that interact with themselves instead of just interacting with other parts of nature around them. And they're, in general, you can't solve nonlinear equations by simple algebraic kinds of decomposition, like x squared plus 5 equals 12. Can I ask you a quick follow-up question on the philosophy of that? Why isn't that most physical um, equations for physics and engineering are tend to be linear and more biological ones um, tend to be nonlinear? So how does chaos fit in the way? So uh, chaos derives very uh, quickly from the idea of nonlinear equations, where if a, if a system interacts with itself, it can lead to qual qualitatively and in some sense quanti or quantitatively and in some sense qualitatively unpredictable behavior, and we can characterize that as chaos. But it, there are many physical systems that are nonlinear that aren't just biological systems. Gravity, um, the most contemporary ideas about gravity, especially Einstein's theory of gravity, entails a bunch of nonlinear equations. They, they entail terms about space and time and gravity and energy that interact with each other to, do, uh, to create chaotic circumstances. But I think you're onto something when you say that some systems like biology or ecology tend to have a lot of nonlinear equations. I think one way to look at that is that as a system becomes more complex, and certainly biology is a very complex system, as a system tends towards greater complexity, the probability that it will have a lot of self-interaction and a lot of uh, very complex dependencies with things we know or things we don't yet know um, become greater. So those kinds of equations, it's hard to write an equation that talks about um, what does a whale look like. Right? Because the system is so complex, it doesn't lend itself to simple mathematical description. Other, yeah. When you describe the, how waves are described and are graphed, and I wanted to make sure I understood, was the ability to do that dependent on the invention or the discovery of imagined numbers? No. So it turns out that imaginary numbers provide us a set of mathematical tools to describe uh, waves and to describe uh, other physical phenomena that entail a lot of uh, rotation. Um, we can describe those much more elegantly, and the, the math that you work through when doing calculations is a lot uh, more uh, accessible in some sense when you use that kind of framework than it is when you presume that it all happens with real numbers. So by, by transforming things into complex notation, um, you can do math, some known math easier, and it opens up whole new realms of math that you just can't do with real numbers. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about quantum mechanics and symmetry theory. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>